As the Undersecretary, she is responsible for the affairs of the Department of the Air Force comprised of the U.S. Air and Space Forces to include organizing and training, equipping for the welfare of approximately 697,000 active duty guard, reserve, and civilian airmen and guardians and their family worldwide. She oversees the, the Department annual budget for more than $250 billion directly strategic and policy, policy development, risk management, weapons acquisition, technology investment, and human resources management across the global enterprise. Ladies and gentlemen, the Honorable Miss Jenny, Jana uh, Ortiz Jones. Great. Yeah, yes, ma'am. So I just came from the War College, uh, and so I'm very excited to talk to, to talk to this group. And, and Chief, thank you for inviting me. Um, good afternoon. Congratulations to our newest E9s, right? We're in various phases of, uh, of the orientation. Um, it's really an honor for me to, to be here. Um, and I'm going to share a little bit, like a little personal story of, of why I'm so honored to talk to this group. Um, you know, I met my first Chief Master Sergeant ever when I was 14 years old. I uh, am a product of junior ROTC at John Jay High School in San Antonio, Texas. Hey, that's right, that's right. And uh, hey, that's right. And, um, and there was a Chief Master Sergeant, Phil Larson, there. And uh, Chief was, he was firm, uh, he was strict. But you know what, we, he demonstrated every single day that he cared about every single one of us. And while that, uh, you know, he taught us drill and ceremony and uniform, uh, he taught us about the core values, certainly. Um, but you know what he taught me? He taught me that I could trust the chevrons, that I could and should trust the chevrons. So that was a very meaning, he played a meaningful role in, in my life in those couple of years and has, to this day, shaped how I think about this group and how I think about how important you are to the Department of the Air Force and making sure that our airmen and our guardians uh, can serve to their full potential. So while that was just decades ago, you can see just how important that was for me. And I'm so thankful that I, just across the hall from me now, have the wonderful Chief Master Sergeant Joanne Bass. Give it up. who is not shy about giving me a blue line check. <laughs> letting, letting me know uh, uh, how that may be understood just a little bit differently in, in certain parts of the Air Force, which I very much appreciate. Um, so look, it's a real honor again for me to be here. I'm gonna share a little bit about uh, where uh, our Secretary of the Air Force is taking the Department of the Air Force, certainly from an operational standpoint um, and from the most important operational standpoint, how we are taking care of our people. And then I very much look forward to your questions. I have yet to meet a shy chief, right? So I look forward to your questions. Okay. So this is my desk. Um, and I don't know if everyone can, can read what it says here, um, but a couple of staff meetings ago, uh, your Secretary of the Air Force challenged each of us to take out a sticky and write on there exactly what this says. War with China and or Russia is likely at any time, right? Don't be confused about the moment in time that we are in. Don't be confused about what has been. We need to focus on what could be. And so this was a way to make sure the Secretariat and the two services that we are all laser focused on ensuring that we are ready for a high-end fight, which could can't, frankly kick off at, at any moment. We are seeing right now what is happening in, in, in the uh, uh, UCOM AOR. Um, and the Secretary and I get an intelligence briefing every single day uh, that only underscores the need for us to be ready for a high-end fight. Um, Y'all, we are very lucky to have Secretary Frank Kendall as our Secretary at this point in time. Uh, not only is he steeped in national security, knows it like few others do, uh, knows the building like few others do, uh, but that knowledge is really only matched uh, by his willingness, his courage, uh, to frankly speak truth to power and be very clear about where we as a Department of the Air Force are in terms of uh, being ready for that high-end fight, um, the risk that we are assuming by not making tough choices across the Department of Defense and how that impacts the Department of the Air Force. So we are really quite lucky to, to, to have him there. 
Uh, he has certainly brought an urgency, I think Chief Bass can speak to this, an urgency with which we, again, um, are, are making these tough choices based on the threat. Um, but I think he probably has it tattooed on him somewhere. Uh, language from Goldwater Nichols that talks about the Secretary's responsibility. The Secretary of the Air Force is responsible for and has the authority necessary to conduct operations, right? Con it's not conduct operations, but conduct functions of which organize, train, and equip, right? And so when we think about organize, train, and equip, the question is always, well, for what? Um, and again, as the, as the intel continually highlights, um, it's very much uh, the Indo-Pacific. And so when he says organize, train, and equip, is wants the staff focused on that, what does that mean in practice? Well, this is what it means. These are his seven operational imperatives. Uh, these are the things that he has asked the staff to focus on to ensure, have we defined these capabilities right? Do we adequately know what we need? And if we don't have what we need, um, how do we get to where we need to be? So let me give you a minute just to read these. Secretary Austin has talked a lot about China being the pacing challenge, right? And we've got a number of strategic documents that are in various phases of completion, right? From the national security strategy, the national defense strategy, uh, the national, uh, excuse me, the, the uh, nuclear posture review, the missile defense review, all of these strategic documents that we've got to be ready to make sure that the Department of the Air Force is delivering combat credible support for. And so when we think about what is needed, we've, a lot of it, as you can see here, many of these start off with define. How do we understand kind of the scope of the challenge that we've got, right? So let me talk a little bit about some of these. Um, and I know this is an Air Force crowd, uh, but you know the first one, we shouldn't be surprised, is, is frankly talking about space. And this is a talking about defining a resilient space order of battle and architectures. So what are some of those things, for example, that we certainly know we need in, 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 uh, that our, our Space Force to, to provide? Um, but how are some of those things potentially going to no longer be done by the Air Force, but be done by the Space Force, right? So this is about what does that architecture need to look like? The second one speaks to um, advanced battle management system. So ABMS, the air contribution to JADC2, right? How do we uh, do command and control in, uh, in, in a high-end fight? What is our, the, air Force's con the Department of the Air Force's contribution to that? Um, the next one is more attack air related. So this is defining the next generation air dominant systems of systems. So right now, NGAD is a multi-hundred million dollar aircraft which is one quite expensive but when we look at what might be needed in a high-end fight in the Indo-Pacific we need different options that provide us some range some different capabilities so this is at looking at what that might look like right um, the next one is achieving mar uh, moving target indicators and tracking at scale um, this is important when we're talking about providing target quality data um, this is uh, an initiative, we, the Space Force is working closely with um, NRO, the National Reconnaissance Office, to figure out what are those, those requirements, how well are we meeting those, and how might the Space Force uh, be able to help address that delta. Uh, again, look, in the, in the Indo-Pacific, it's about helping us ensure we can buy ourselves as much time as possible, and we do that by having a good understanding of where some of those targets uh, may be moving or not. Uh, this, uh, this next one, defining optimized, resilient basing, sustainment, and communications in a contested environment. How are we going to do those very basic things that we need in an, an environment that, again, that in, a, in a contested environment? This is, not, um, this is not the Middle East. You're not just going to go into a place that has been kind of well set up and, and kind of... And, and, um, uh, and, and resume those operations. Many of these are I mean, obviously quite austere. Many of you may have actually been to some of these small islands in the Indo-Pacific where we're trying to build some type of presence, presence excuse me, 
um, that, we would, that would be necessary for us to operate from. Um, but it's not just where we operate from, it's how we do that, right? How do we logistically support this? What are the types of comms, uh, secure comms in particular that we need? Um, I think it's actually pretty interesting that the third largest AFSC here are cyber defense operators. Do I have that right? Yeah, where are you? Are you here? Do they, are they skipping on class today? Too? No, no. <laughs> I think the top one, right, the top one is aircraft maintainers. And then, yeah, oh, okay. And then the second one's are, are defenders, if I have that right. Okay, I did. They're here, they're here. Um, the next one is defining the B-21 long-range strike family of s systems. So this is not unlike uh, the NGAD one, right? How do we pair these things, uh, these platforms rather, with uncrewed platforms that can give us additional range, additional capacity um, based on what, they are, what they're carrying? Again, because we've got to buy ourselves time uh, in, in, in that type of uh, in engagement. And then lastly, as we do all these things, how well is the Department of the Air Force ready to transition to that posture? How well can we do all of those things that we just talked about, right? I mean, we make some assumptions about how much warning time we would have, um, when we would know actually things are kicking off, but how, once we do under have that understanding, how quickly can the, tra the DAF transition uh, to, to a wartime posture against a peer competitor, right? A peer being the, 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 uh, the key piece of this. So this is how your Secretary of the Air Force has translated uh, his responsibility to organize, train, and equip the force. Um, we learned, uh, I mean, I think we all learned a long time ago, there's a difference between what we want, though, and what we can get. And so uh, let me articulate some of the challenges uh, that we've got to realizing and, frankly, funding a lot of those things. Um, so those 18 words on that first bullet there, uh, maintaining legacy platforms and excess infrastructure is eating into our ability to modernize and address the pacing challenge. Um, I must spend 75, and the secretary must spend 75% of our days saying that those 18 words in a different way based on the meeting that we're in. This is fundamentally the challenge of the Department of the Air Force right now. And so the secretary and I, and certainly the two chiefs, spend a lot of time on Capitol Hill, helping those folks understand not only um, the delta between where we are and where we need to be, but also how wide that delta is, right? I mean, if we're gonna pivot um, and, and, and focus on the pacing challenge and make sure we're ready to address that, then resources must follow. Resources must follow. And that requires some really hard choices about what we stop doing. Um, but we've gotta be, and so painting that picture of, of the cost of some of these legacy platforms that, to be honest, are, are not going to be what we need in a high-end fight. So not only is the platform legacy, the excess infrastructure that we've got, right? I mean, you can see there in the numbers, 30 years ago, uh, since la in the last 30 years, 60% fewer fighter squadrons, 40% fewer airmen, but only 15% fewer installations. And I'm sure every one of you has served on a base uh, where you've seen a building and said, you know what, that should probably be demolished. Uh, because it, it, is, it is, frankly, expensive to maintain in its current form, um, but there are a number of, there are, again, restrictions that are preventing us from doing that. So we're pounding the drum uh, with those folks that can help us with, with funding, certainly lifting some of the restrictions, uh, congressional restrictions, that are affecting our ability to move as quickly as we need to. Uh, let me talk a little bit about, um, frankly, our, our as important war fighting imperative, which is how we take care of our people. Um, these next two slides were slides that the secretary uh, showed at a recent offsite uh, to, that was hosted by the Secretary of Defense um, and his key leadership team. And uh, the secretary, secretary Kendall was asked to talk about how he is helping to realize Secretary Austin's vision of taking care of our people. And so what he did is he pointed, and again, it's this slide and the next slide, uh, which identifies a couple of key findings, but he pointed to the ways in which we are using these reports, the data provided, um, frankly, 100,000 pages, excuse me, 100,000 comments, 17,000 pages of, of, of single-spaced text, um, and really uh, quite a bit of trust that you've been placed uh, in us to, uh, to take action and get after these things. And we are working hard to do so. Um, I will call, I want to highlight a, a couple of them. Um, the, 
when the secretary and I uh, got here in, not got here, got to the positions rather, in late July, early August, several weeks right after that, um, uh, was the outbrief for the second report, um, which looked at some of those disparities um, by race and race and ethnicity, and then separately by gender. Um, and if, if you think those numbers are bad uh, or not what we'd like them to be, um, you can imagine what they would be at the intersection of those three things, race, gender, and ethnicity. However, that wasn't part of the report. Um, so I asked RIG to go back, look at that exact same data, put on that other additional filter, and help us understand how the story changes when you do that type of analysis. Because again, this is about being the best department of the Air Force that we can be. And if we are not understanding the experience of 10% of the workforce, then what are we missing? Right? What are we, what are we um, failing to understand, certainly when we retain talent, but potentially is affecting our ability to recruit talent? And this is important. The Secretary and I talk a lot about um, certainly propensity to serve, making sure we are able to, uh, to tap into the to nation's talent wherever it might be. Um, and when we look at uh, dealing with the effects of the 2008 recession, right, which is a smaller population, on top of the, uh, the medical increasing percentage of our young people that are medically not qualified to serve, we've got to be ruthless in how we recruit and go after the nation's talent. And so, again, part of that is understanding how we are communicating somebody's ability to serve to their full potential in the Department of the Air Force. Because we can have great commercials, right? We can have a flyover at the Super Bowl. Um, but if somebody's understanding of the Department of the Air Force is the murder of Specialist Vanessa Guillen or the murder of A1C Van uh, Apa Shen, then that's a problem. Um, and we've got to work to address that. And so, again, this data helps us understand, make those data um, informed policies to ensure everyone can serve to their full potential. This next slide are some of the key findings that the Secretary highlighted. And again, this is the exact slide that he showed to the Secretary of Defense. I'm going to let you read these and then just raise your hand when you're done. Uh, raise your hand, keep your hand up when it's done. Thank you. on you. Just kidding. <laughs> Some things, these things I'm kidding, right? <laughs> okay, thanks. Please put your hands down. Um, but again, you know, the secretary, uh, he can talk um, operational imperatives, but he knows that our number one operational imperative is the trust, the trust that our people have in our commitment to their safety, to their, um, to their ability to succeed, and their ability to serve to their full potential recognizing that anyone, again, courageous enough to raise their right hand, say that they are willing to protect and defend the Constitution, should have the opportunity to do so to their full potential. So these are the types of things um, that are, are um, you know, contextualizing some of the data, the very clear data uh, that we see in disparities in promotions, um, professional military education opportunities, um, um, as well as professional opportunities. So um, look, we are, working to do what we can do from the Pentagon. Um, but I think we all know that the work to get after some of these things is going to be, is going to happen in your operational units. And it's going to happen based on your words, your actions, that now informed by not only these things, but the, the, other, the other data in the report, um, and how you take action on that, right? Because if we don't get after this, uh, we are not going to have access to the nation's best talent. We are not going to live up to our core values, integrity first, service before self, excellence in all we do. I mean, this is just an expression of that. I think, moreover, I think, look, the fact that one in four female respondents delayed re informing their commander they were pregnant due to the fear of being denied professional opportunities, that's an operational risk, 
right? So these are readiness issues that we have to treat them as such, and the Secretary and I are committed to doing that. Um, uh, there, we've set up a, uh, an Office of Diversity and Inclusion that is meant to advise the rest of the staff, the Secretariat, as well as the Air and Space staff on how do we ensure that our processes are reflective not only of the data, but are, we, are, we are also looking at and making sure that we are, don't have any um, assumptions built into our processes that might be exacerbating some of these. We're actively um, actioning the recommendations that are coming out of the barrier analysis working groups. I really want to thank Chief Bass for her leadership on Fortify the Force. That'll be another critical barrier analysis group that flags for us the ways in which we can improve uh, the resiliency across the force. And I got it. There's an idea. And now it's up to us leaders to go fund it. Understood. Understood. I hear you loud and clear. Um, I would also ask that you frankly just do um, what I know chiefs are good at doing, <laughs> which is asking questions um, and making sure that we're taking care of our folks, um, asking why, asking why not, asking where is the data. Um, I recently did that uh, with the, well, one of the things I am very excited about whenever it comes across my desk is the opportunity to select folks for uh, the commissioning program, the Schlepp program. And I looked at an application recently, and in the waiver section, this woman uh, had to submit a waiver for being pregnant. And I just thought to myself, why does anyone have to submit a waiver to be, uh, for being pregnant for a commissioning program? It just doesn't make sense. So I asked, I, it wasn't, or at least didn't make sense to me kind of inherently. So I asked MR, our uh, Manpower Resources um, Division, uh, for whom A1 kind of uh, supports, right? Hey, what are all those gender-specific policies? Um, because my concern, I'll be honest with you, when I read that initially, is that, you know what? I bet you someone didn't apply because they didn't want to submit a waiver. And if we don't even know why we need a waiver, or we've been just been doing this because it is the process and no one can explain, no one has yet to explain to me why that was there, to be honest with you, or the benefit of it, um, then we are not tapping into the talent and the force. Because we know that deters somebody potentially from applying. We also know that when, a, frankly, when somebody is looking at packages about which one to put forth, do they put the one that has a waiver or doesn't? They potentially put the one, right, more often than not, the one that doesn't because they want it to, to be successful and they think a waiver will be hard to overcome. So we've got to ask these questions about why, why do we do that, right? That is, uh, help me understand why that is, and I think that's fair. I had a, a great lunch with um, a couple of airmen, <clears throat> actually about 10 folks, and I don't think anyone had been in for more than five years. Um, and they were, uh, they were, they had some, some, they were not shy either, honestly. <laughs> they were all ready to be chiefs. Um, and a lot of them actually had joined since, uh, since COVID. So it was here, interesting to hear kind of their own experiences. Thankfully, they're all having a great time here at Maxwell, which is wonderful. Um, but I also encourage them, you know, you, this is your time. This is your time. This is also your service. So ask questions, right? Ask questions. Um, to make us, help us be a, a better department of the Air Force. So um, let me uh, see if I want to highlight any other ones on here. I mean, this is fundamentally a readiness issue. This is fundamentally a leadership issue, and we need your help to get after this. So that is what your leadership team is up to. Your leadership team is focused on the high-end fight, making sure we are ready, and we are also making sure that all of our airmen and our guardians and our civil servants can serve to their full potential, right? We don't have time, we don't have talent to lose. Um, and I think sometimes it's important to be uh, reminded of the consequences of not living up to um, kind of what we all know we are, we are capable of and not leading um, uh, in a way that uh, our airmen and our guardians all deserve. And so you certainly know Specialist Vanessa Guillen, I hope you would also know um, A1C Natasha Poshen, uh, talent that we lost needlessly. Uh, and talent we could, should still have, um, and leadership could have made a difference. All right. All right, so with that, um, I wanted to get off the stage with just reminding you of how our work certainly is focused on strengthening the Department of the Air Force, is relying on your talents and your leadership, um, but also is, of course, lockstep with the Secretary of Defense and his priorities, defend the nation, take care of our people, succeed through teamwork. I'm remiss in that on the operational imperative slide, I did not uh, hit as hard what I would have liked to in terms of our, uh, the importance of the work that we do with our um, partners and our allies. 
Um, one of the things that we're doing separately, the management initiatives, which is more kind of headquarters focus uh, that I'm leading on behalf of the secretary, is, is looking at our international affairs capacity. How well can we do that? I'm really thankful that Chief Bass uh, has helped inform how we think about our capacity to work with our partners and allies and the important role that our enlisted force um, and our enlisted engagements provide. Um, so the, again, these are the, uh, the SecDef's top priorities. Uh, as you all know, what interests your boss fascinates the heck out of you. So, <laughs> so all of our things are certainly in, in support of the SecDef's priorities. If you hadn't seen those, uh, good time to be refreshed. Okay, all right, with that, I am open to all of your true false questions. Just kidding. <laughs> Who's got some questions? I've been known to call on people too, so don't be shy. Oh, don't be nervous. Chiefs, come on, Chiefs. All right, I'm going to call him. Chief, I'm going to count to five. Then. Oh, okay. Oh, there's a mic. Gotcha. Good afternoon, ma'am. Hi there. My name is Senior Master Sergeant Letta. I'm over from Langley Air Force Base. So my question is in regards to the competition with China mm. and say Secretary of Defense priority number one and number three. Mm. Um, we're talking about, talking about leverage and using our full capacity, not as a military, but as a nation. Mm. Has there been talks in leveraging the civilian world in regards to um, cyber capabilities when we're talking about Google, Apple, um, what they can bring to fight if worst case scenario um, to incur to our nation? Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, and I think you're, you're thinking about this in exactly the right way, which is uh, this is not only a military challenge. Uh, this is something that we've got to look holistically, certainly across the interagency, um, but also, to your point, um, our, our international partners as well as uh, the commercial sector. Um, one of the operational imperatives, the first one actually, talks about defining a resilient space-based uh, um, space order battle, excuse me, um, and architecture, a lot of that will leverage commercial capabilities, right? I mean, the, the advancements in the commercial sector of, of, of space are just frankly wonderful opportunities uh, for, for us to take advantage of that, whether you're talking about SATCOM, or you're talking about launch capability. So there's, that's, that, that's one way in which we can complement and certainly leverage, to use your word, uh, some of the capabilities that already exist. And frankly, we don't have to spend a lot of time and our own resources developing that. Um, I think you also bring up a really good point in terms of um, what are the other things that we can do to buy ourselves some time. We need, a, we need <laughs> we, this is, a, this is um, kind of where we are versus where we need to be. We need some time to get there. As you, as you saw in the operational imperatives, a lot of that is defining it, right? So you're even just kind of scoping what do we need? How do we get after this challenge? Uh, on top of then the, uh, the process to bring on these capabilities, train with it, make it interoperable with our partners and our allies, um, and then make sure it's, it's where we want it, want it to be. Like that doesn't happen overnight. Um, so one of the ways in which we are looking at um, ensuring we've got kind of the, the, full, the full gamut of capabilities is really leveraging our partners and our allies. So many of you may be familiar with AUKUS, right? This is a new uh, partnership that the administration, Pre President uh, Biden announced, and this is between us, with Australia and with the UK. And this is really focused on developing capabilities together, um, you know, leveraging each other's expertise, but also making it interoperable from the get-go. Right? And so what are we focused on right away? We're focused on the first tranche is four things. Um, so quantum, um, undersea capabilities, um, AI, um, as well as cyber. Right? What are those things that we can focus on, develop together um, to help, frankly, help cost, uh, save, uh, cost savings wise, um, but also make sure, again, it's inter interoperable from the very beginning. Um, and the next tranche is, and we're already focused on the next tranche, uh, is hypersonics, hyper, uh, counter hypersonics, electronic warfare, bio defense, as well as space. And so um, there are critical ways in which our, our commercial, um, uh, uh, commercial, we can leverage commercial technology and whatnot, but I think part of it is, um, as, as, as 
based on the slide, kind of defining first what we need um, from an operational perspective and then how can we best leverage um, our partners and allies and what they bring to bear. Good afternoon, ma'am. I'm Senior Master Sergeant Tony Boston from Barcelona Air Force Base. Um, I know it's been a short time since the, the report was released back in 2020 for the racial mm. disparity. Mm. Uh, it's only been a couple years, but my, my question is, have there been any data uh, given to you or anybody else showing any improvements or anything that has changed since then to show that we are going in the right direction? Yeah. You know, some of this is, um, uh, we have done a, a, a six month um, kind of uh, assessment, right, of, of how well things, these things are going. And as you saw on the slide, um, this is something that we will continue to look at to your point to make sure that we are making progress. Um, is, there, is, it, is it happening overnight? Is it even happening in a year? Um, not as quickly as we all would like, to be frank. Um, it, but we are continuing to, to look at how we can pr improve upon this. Um, some of this, frankly, goes back even to PME. Right? How do we um, address, uh, for example, unconscious bias? Um, how can we, uh, kind of, not only on the enlisted side, but on the officer side, how can we um, uh, highlight some of these disparities, making sure that people understand these are a real thing, these are some, some, some ways in which um, we can uh, address those things by asking, for example, why don't we look at the intersection of race, gender, and ethnicity versus just looking at those two separately. So we're continuing to collect the data. We're continuing to ensure that we are um, um, really thinking through, for example, the recommendations from the barrier analysis group about ways in which we can um, address some of these disparities um, and ensure that our policies and our actions convey that we value everyone's uh, service certainly equally and, and want to make sure people can serve to their full potential. It's not happening as fast as we would like, um, but your, your secretary and I are committed to doing so. Good afternoon, ma'am. Senior Master Sergeant Blaine, off at Air Force Base. Um, my question is about recruiting civilian talent. Um, recently, I'll just give you an example from my squadron. We had been recruiting a college student, mm. and they just graduated. They got approved for the job, but when they completed their SF-86, they were honest and said that they had partaken in recreational use of marijuana. Mm. That person was then declined the offer. So for, as a society, as we continue to transition, I think it's gonna be very difficult to recruit young people if one, their use of legal marijuana use at this point because they're not even with us yet. Um, but my, just, my question in general is what's the mindset on that? What are we doing in terms of understanding the changes in social norms and how are we conforming to that within the DOD? That's a really good question. I mean, we think about talent writ large, right? As I talked about some of the challenges, um, certainly as you have a smaller population, but then also less people that are able to, to serve in the military. But your point is well taken, and it's something that we spend uh, equal amount of time talking about is how are we ensuring that there's suffi sufficient civilian talent, uh, certainly in STEM. Uh, and so we've got to, uh, I think to your point, um, ensure that, uh, that you know, we've got we understand the ways in which current policies may be preventing us from from um, uh, from, ac from accessing all of that. But as you know, as, as you well know, I mean, we are limited in what the Department of the Air Force can do on an issue that is, um, frankly, out of our hands, <laughs> right? I mean, this is something that uh, the, the Department of Defense, um, uh, frankly, U.S. government is, is, this is a U.S. government policy. Um, and so this is, um, but, I, but I think your, your, your point is, is well taken. I think, you know, the other place where this comes up um, is also in mental health. Um, the fact that you have a lot of young people that um, are, have accustomed, been accustomed to um, um, uh, leveraging mental, mental health um, in a healthy way, right, and, and ensuring that um, uh, they are utilizing that, that resource as needed, um, and, the, and for that to potentially impact their ability to serve is also, I mean, I think a good example of the, the, the general point that you're raising. And so um, I can tell you we're, we're actively looking um, kind of at, at these things, uh, but I, I don't have a specific kind of timeline for you uh, right now um, on, on when something like that might change, just because, again, it is kind of several echelons above the, uh, the Department of the Air Force.
Good afternoon, ma'am. Chief Washington, Luke Air Force Base. Uh, concerning the relationship for uh, big corporations here in America, uh, how uh, involved are they in the process? You, we talk about accelerate, change or lose, China and Russia. How involved are they in the process uh, as far as helping us defend the freedoms that they enjoy? Um, well, I think, you, you know, this is a, uh, when I think, when I uh, talked about some of those capabilities that we'll need, uh, we're certainly not going to develop those internally within the Department of the Air Force, but it is about kind of scoping it and understanding um, what, what we need to do and then working with research labs, with industry, to your question, um, about how something like that might be developed and by when, and does that address the threat um, as we understand it. So um, there's a, a, you know, a healthy understanding of, of the need to ensure that um, we are working and providing good feedback, good requirements to, to, our, um, to, to, the, to industry um, and, and leveraging uh, those technologies that can help us um, bring meaningful operational capability as quickly as possible um, and put it into the hands of the warfighter. Hello, ma'am. I'm Sergeant Parrish from Joint Base San Antonio. Hey. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Uh, my question is in regards to a policy that Air Education Training Command has in re uh, relation to diversity and inclusion. Mm. Uh, specifically, uh, ATC leaned forward after the disparity review and conducted analysis and research and created a policy to um, try to discourage the use of discrimination and other type of um, uh, behaviors from the work center by mm -hmm. requiring a general court martial convening authority notification, similar to what's required for uh, sexual harassment. So my question is in regards to what is DAF doing to try to also curb those type of destructive behaviors? Yeah, so um, I, I'd have to look specifically at, at, at what you're, you're talking about, so for, forgive me for not being uh, uh, super specific on on um, on spun up on, on that specific AETC uh, policy, but I, I will look into it. Um, when we think about the, uh, so I'm going to speak generally then because I can't speak exactly to what's included in that policy. Um, the the behaviors um, that are counterproductive to ensuring that everybody can serve to their full potential, I think um, there are perceptions and there is data to, to back that up, that is really the point of ensuring that we are asking the tough questions so we can collect the data so folks cannot say, oh, that's just somebody's belief. Well, I mean, somebody's belief is probably based on their experience, right? And it's important that we understand that. I mean, certainly the fact that we had to do an addendum to the experiences and disparities of 10% of the force uh, shows a blind spot, and I'm glad that we addressed it and looked at the data to ensure we are being um, uh, as holistic and as effective in our approaches. Um, because the last thing that we want to do is um, is put something in place uh, that uh, exacerbates, um, uh, you know, a, a challenge or a disparity that that we've got. So um, I owe you some some feedback on on uh, on that AETC policy um, and and what might be. Uh, and, uh, useful at a, at a DAF level. Howdy, ma'am. Uh, Sinu Davis here from Ramstein Air Base. Yeah. Over here. Okay. <laughs> so the topic du jour uh, today has really been focused on China, yeah. uh, and a lot of the uh, things that we've talked about today have highlighted China and, and our needs to get after that situation. But going back to the sticky note that you had there leading mm. off, yeah. uh, it talked about Russia and or China, mm -hmm. and using the operative term of and Russia and China, where are we at from an OT&E perspective with our ability to face that potential situation? Talk about Russia? Both at the same time. Yeah. Well, uh, at the same time. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, well, I mean, look, I think we're all, um, you know, we're all watching the news and, um, and are being kept up to date by, by the intelligence and how quickly that, that situation is, is evolving. 
um, and the, frankly, what that means for for the alliance um, and and our partners and our allies in um, in the region. Um, so, where are we in relation to a potential uh, having the capabilities to to if we were to be in a war with with both of them at the same time? Is that your is that your question? Well, one that'd be very difficult, um, and uh, the. The, the operational imperatives, those are not specific to an AOR. Those are types, those are the capabil the war fighting capabilities um, that are necessary. And so when we look at um, the threats in certain time frames, you know, how, and, and based on, on, the, on the region, um, the answer to that question is different. Um, and again, that you know, time, space, purpose, right? Those are all things that really scope our ability to do what you just said. So in the near term, um, and this is actually something that we spend a lot of time helping to explain on, on the Hill, which is uh, you know, when you evacuate 120,000 people out of Afghanistan in about two weeks, that takes a significant toll on, on the workforce and certainly our platforms. And so helping them, for example, understand the time needed uh, to make up for lost exercise time, for the wear and tear on the platforms, certainly on uh, the effect on our personnel, um, helping them understand that you know doing these things, these aren't, these aren't. Uh, I mean, it's it's not uh, cost neutral, right? And some of these costs are are not as apparent as, uh, as others, um, and and that is risk and readiness to to get back to your question. So. Um, it would be a challenge to do that. We are defining what those operational capabilities would be and ensuring that we've got the, the are, are as close to getting the right capabilities by that time as, as necessary. Hey ma'am, I'm uh, uh, Chief Retired Kirk Patrick. I just wanna ask this question ah. really quickly. Hopefully you can hear me. Um, I know you, you and the secretary spent a lot of time, as you mentioned a few times on the Hill, advocating mm -hmm. on behalf of air and space power and on behalf of all the airmen here. What can we do at our leadership level, at the leadership level of this mm -hmm. room, to support the messaging, the activities, the things that you're doing to try to get after? What are some things that we can do to try to help support that? Yeah, thank you. What a good question. Um, the, uh, well, look, I, I, I need you all, uh, one, Keep us accountable, right? Keep us accountable. Um, mentioned earlier, things are not moving as fast as they need to, um, and I'm with you. Highlight ways in which we could expedite some of these things. Um, making sure that, uh, again, we can make these programs and do these things from the Pentagon, but so much that rests on, on what you do in your, in your unit, in your unit to show that we, as a Department of the Air Force, are committed to the, to the success of every, and safety of every single airman and guardian. Um, when you are, I mean, I'll be honest with you, when you are working with your, um, um, your uh, partners, your uh, community partners uh, in the area, and I know um, they're a great resource, they're also a great uh, resource to help carry our message with these members of Congress. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, they carry a lot of weight. Again, we just don't have time or talent to lose. So folks that will listen and folks that will help us, um, help the country, um, those, we need to leverage those opportunities. So if you can engage with those, civilian, those civilians, uh, um, I would encourage you to do so. But, you know, my ask is to make sure that, that we are taking care of our airmen. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a pretty simple ask. I, I know that. Uh, but if there are ways in which we can do that better, Please flag those, um, and, and we'll continue to, to uh, work hard to address those. Chief, I'm standing in between y'all and happy hour, I think. <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> Any more questions? Okay, well good. Well look, thank you again for the opportunity. I appreciate your very good questions um, and I, I appreciate your help in, in getting after these things. And I know I can depend on y'all uh, because again, I learned a long time ago so I can trust those, those, those chevrons, right? So thank you for what you do. It's an honor to serve with you. Thanks. Yeah.